Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Terry Gurton. I'm the president of the National Academy of Public Administration, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the Academy's virtual conference room. Uh, we've got an exciting conversation on tap today on the role of public administration in protecting our environment. And the discussion is so timely because I'm sure that you are all aware over the last couple of days, President Biden's been hosting 40 nations for a global climate summit. And he made a bold commitment that the United States will cut its greenhouse gas emissions by as much as 52% by the end of this decade. And of course, uh, recently the United States has also rejoined the Paris Agreement, uh, established a national climate task force and set a goal to reach net zero emissions economy wide by no later than 2050. These bold policy steps all have something in common though. They need public administrators to put in place the regulations, the processes and the practices to make them happen. And that's what our panelists are going to discuss today. Uh, before we get started, I do want to share with you how we'll manage today's Zoom conversation. We'll be centrally muting all of you for the opening discussion, but we invite you to submit your questions using the chat function at any time. Once we open the Q&A portion, we'll be reviewing those chat questions, or you may raise your virtual hand using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to put yourself in the live question queue. If you do have any technical issues, please chat directly with Pratush Sode, and he'll assist you. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, Bob Perciseppi. Bob is the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, which is widely recognized in the United States and internationally as a leading independent voice for practical policy and action to address our energy and climate challenges. He has been an environmental policy leader in and out of government for more than 40 years. And most recently, he served as the deputy administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He's a respected expert on environmental stewardship, natural resource management, and public policy, and has built a reputation for bringing stakeholders together to solve issues. He is also a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, yes, yeah, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is that whole idea of bringing people together, you know, the role of public administrators trying to, uh, get programs to work and operate. And so I'm gonna do a little bit of context here on uh, what we're talking about. Terry uh, introduced a number of the points in particular, <clears throat> what's currently going on in the administration in terms of their uh, re-emerging uh, or reestablishing uh, in, um, <clears throat> in the international arena with the, with the summit. I, I watched a little bit of it yesterday morning. I was taken by the fact that you know, the, the government leaders of Russia, China, India, most of the European countries, other countries around the world, Saudi Arabia, all participated. They at least zoomed in, as we can say in our modern world, uh, to, uh, to make a few comments and talk about the importance of climate change. And there was a little bit of a, you know, I, I won't go too far down this, this uh, direction, but there was a little bit of interesting a nuance to uh, some of the comments, particularly uh, uh, President Xi and China and, and, and even uh, Vladimir Putin, where they, they, they clearly made it, they made it obvious that there were disagreements. But they also said that something like climate change is, is something that we need to put some of those agreements aside on and, and work together on, which I thought was quite remarkable that a number of them said those things. Now, you know, saying words in a forum uh, on a Zoom call. Um, you know, who knows how that carries through, but you know, it was public and wasn't a private conversation. And so I, I felt, I felt, you know, at least a sense of hope that, um, you know, a lot of the countries around the world could put aside their other very, very difficult decisions from human rights to intellectual property rights, uh, you know, to military adventurism, uh, terrorism support. I mean, all these things are really difficult, difficult problems, but there seemed to be a sense that all that gets worse if we don't deal with this particular issue. And so I, I, I felt that that was good. So, and that was on Earth Day, uh, Terry, it is Earth Day and yesterday and it's Earth Week. And we really do pay, you know, turn our attention to some of the natural resources and um, 
environmental and climate type issues that we have before us. And so it's really a, a timely moment um, with the summit going on, with it being, let's just call it Earth Week. Um, you know, a lot of people will be doing public service over the weekend, you know, cleaning streams, um, doing some forest, local forest management practices. Uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities uh, over the weekend and a lot of people will be participating in them. And so that's all, that's all good. You know, at the, the other thing about the, the summit, which is still going on today a little bit, is the different subjects that they were touching on. And it's an interesting alignment with a lot of those subjects that they're talking about internationally with the subjects that we were focusing on a lot in our uh, uh, NAPA re recommendations last fall to the new administration. We put together a package of recommendations uh, across a number of subject areas. We call them the grand challenges for public administration. And they were really focused in a bipartisan way or let me say the better way to say it, it was a nonpartisan way toward what will the new administration need to be doing in this arena. And we assume that no matter who was elected, they would have to be doing something. And so, um, and, and building on things that had already been going on. And we'll hear some of that when we talk to our panelists in a moment. Um, and so uh, the recommendations, I, I'm gonna do a little bit of context here and talk about them a minute so to build more, more context for our conversation, because I think it's an important, uh, important to, to move uh, the conversation forward within the context that, that we have spent so much time last year looking at uh, for the, the academy. So uh, there are five, five whoop, that's 10, five, five, five large major areas um, uh, that, that we identify. There's a lot of information in that report, but there's five they're summarized in five different ways after talking about what's currently going on. First is, you know, uh, and, and we'll, uh, you know, we have panelists here that will help us talk about this a little bit, optimize federal research in both natural resources and in, um, in the climate arena. Um, you know, one of the more difficult things to do, as we're going to see, and we're going to talk about is to coordinate all the different resources that are out there. For example, I think we point out in our report that on the natural resources side alone, there are over 15,000 public agencies in the United States that have some role in natural resource management when you look at it broadly. And that, you know, for instance, considering the, the Army Corps of Engineers as much as the Department of Interior, state, state um, natural resource or parks agencies and local park agencies. So you, you can see then tribal government. So, uh, there, there's an immense amount of how do you get that all to work together or, or support each other is probably maybe the most important thing. So optimizing federal research falls into that category. You know, there's many different agencies involved. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. One of my first questions for the panelists will be about uh, intergovernmental uh, coordination. The other thing we pointed out, um, again, uh, looking ahead last year to this year was the, the really important role of natural infrastructure. And again, you're, you, you see this starting to come into actions going on in the United States Congress. Uh, I think yesterday, I think if I'm not right, I think I'm right. Yesterday, there was a bipartisan bill introduced um, uh, called Growing Climate Solutions. Um, you can imagine what that means. Growing is not growing it in a laboratory. It's you know, it's a, it's looking at natural solutions and how to how to uh, make sure that the uh, those solutions are being uh, implemented and how they are being uh, managed and and made credible. Um, that's an important part of that. So it also intersects with resilience. And the panel. You know, Napa had a report on resilience, and and we have we'll be talking about that during our panel discussion as well. The third area I want to point out is, um, you know, coordinating um, and expediting renewable energy. Um, and you know, here you get into a whole host of issues, uh, whether it's uh, raising the capital to do it, whether it's uh, the permitting processes, which is obviously in the wheelhouse of public administrators. How do we make these permitting processes work? You see um, 
uh, the last administration and the current administration all talking about uh, you know expediting permitting and looking at different programs. Uh, uh, there's a particular emphasis right now in the Biden Harris administration looking at offshore wind resources and how to the many different agencies that are involved with that to get that coordinated. Um, the other one, the the fourth one is enhance forest health, and whether it's the growing. Climate Solutions Act or the president's own executive order in the first week that he was in office where he laid out a lot of interagency uh, activities and priorities, including forest management. And it's in those of us who follow the federal budget during transition between one administration and the other know what a skinny budget is. It's what a new administration doesn't have time to do the full budget, so they do a skinnier one and it has to do with how thick it is. Um, and then later on follow up with the details. But the skinny budget that was put forward a, a couple of weeks ago actually includes some increased funding for uh, forest management and, and how that relates also to mitigation. I guess the last thing I'll mention, which is sort of inherent in all these things and was one of the key recommendations of, of, uh, of, the, of Napa, including you know, organizing the White House to be a, a more powerful coordinator. And that is, you know, coordinating across all the different federal agencies. And then, you know, somebody says, well, what, to what end do we need to coordinate across all the federal agencies? Well, I participated at, on a steering committee of a, of a resilience uh, task force recently. It came out with a report also earlier this week. Um, it was called the Resilience Roadmap. And, and in that roadmap, it really talked about the federal role in the arena of climate resilience. And of course, that gets into a lot of other things of community well-being, justice, and, and other important issues. The federal role of being an important supporter of the local efforts that are going on, local, state, and tribal efforts. Not to come in with the, here's the grand plan on how to do resilience, but here's a grand coordinated federal support structure for the resilience work that's going on. And uh, you know, again, I think we'll be able to hear some of that. And that was right in the alley of what uh, the National Academy was was talking about. So the last thing I'm going to do by way of introduction um, here and context is just mention briefly because we do this in our in our report from last fall. Uh, but obviously, more things we we started off with what's already going on in the federal government. But obviously, there's more stuff going on. I thought maybe I would just mention a few of those things that are going on. We've already so talked to um, Terry talked about the 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 global. A leaders summit that's underway, you know, which is you know, a lot of that is trying to build momentum going to the conference of parties later in the year in um, um, in uh, Glasgow, uh, the UK, which, by the way, if I can digress with a tiny bit of humor, I thought the best quote from a world leader yesterday was from Boris Johnson, where he said, we're not talking about bunny hugging here. So uh, that's a quote. So, um, this, this is, uh, you know, th these world leaders are focusing on this. So the, in, the, the, Terry mentioned the summit. Well, uh, President Biden appointed um, John, for, former Senator John Kerry to be the, his personal presidential envoy on climate change. And Secretary Kerry, uh, former Secretary Kerry has been, want, and Senator has been wandering around the world, uh, talking to a lot of these world leaders inside the domestic world, um, reestablishing the Office of Science and Technology Policy with a uh, PCAST, a, uh, a, a science advisory uh, group, um, and also uh, a climate advisor assistant to the president, uh, Gina, Gina McCarthy. Um, you know, obviously, the president has rejoined the Paris Agreement, um, uh, but he's directed also in his executive orders, uh, taking, uh, you know, being clear about using science and decision making. Um, uh, and uh, incorporate, and this is important, and, and we talked about this a little bit in our report, and there were other parts of the Academy's um, grand challenges that touched on it even more in the resilience and on other locations, is the, is the issue of uh, social equity and environmental justice and how that's incorporated. So I'll be asking the panelists a little bit about that as we go forward. But that they have really put that forward as a as a key as a key uh, advantage uh, or or a key uh, driver of some of the work. And I often look at this, and people say, "Well, you know, 
obviously looking at where vulnerable communities are is, is a pretty straightforward thing, but it's more complicated than that. It's really looking at if there are all these benefits of going through a transition on energy and becoming more resilient, benefits with jobs, benefits with uh, safer communities, everything. How do we make sure that those benefits are equitably distributed? And then there's the others of, in some communities that are, that are where jobs may be transitioning away. How do we come back fill with a more uh, solid economic development program? So a lot of that stuff is starting up um, and, uh, and was alluded to. So now I'm going to get to the panel. I think I've given enough context here. Um, and we really want to hear from others who uh, are, are, are in the field. And so I'm going to give them a high level introduction here and, and eat both uh, all three of you can feel free to chime in more on, on what you're doing. Um, but then I'll, I'll open it with a very high level basic question that tries to tie some of that, what I just said together. So uh, first I want to uh, introduce Chavanda Jacobs-Young, who is the uh, administrator of the Agricultural Research Service in the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and we're very excited to have her with us. Uh, I mentioned coordinating across the agencies on science. Well, coordinating across, for instance, all the land grant colleges and all the local ag departments and the cooperative extension agent. And, you know, there's tons of coordinating just inside, you know, the USDA. And so, uh, Tavanda, we're looking forward to your, to your comments. Next, I want to mention Scott Cameron, who's the who was the Assistant Secretary for Management and Budget at the Department of Interior. That's a, you know, both of these agencies are, are fairly large agencies compared to a place where I worked, uh, which was an amateur agency, a little tiny one with only 15,000 employees. These guys, these guys have tens of thousands of employees and offices all over the, all over the, all over the country. And, uh, and sometimes it's controversial where those offices are, Scott, but, the, uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of coordination even inside the agency. And then I wanna uh, introduce James Murley, who is the uh, uh, chief resilience officer, uh, I think in the Miami-Dade area. And you, know, I, I, you, you, you heard me allude to the fact that how can the federal government support you know, the local levers? So Southern, part of Florida, not down, well, the Keys also, but certainly the highly populated Southern part of Florida has been on this issue for quite a while and how they interact with the federal government, whether it's managing the Everglades or dealing with the beaches or a whole host of things, uh, you know, James will be able to chime in on that stuff. So thank you guys for joining uh, and we really appreciate it. So let me get, let me get to the first, uh, you know, question I think that would be helpful for you guys to, to talk about because it's sort of taking this context and bringing it home. Like, all right, what am I facing when I get back, when I get off the Zoom call, what am I doing? You know, so, uh, you know, the, the other stuff, right? So, so look, thinking about all of that and what our recommendations were and what's already going on, you know, so think about the near term, you know, like the next year, uh, you know, as things are setting up or revolving. You know, what are, what are some of those opportunities for um, federal, state, local, and tribal government uh, to work together on, on the stewarding of resources and climate change issues? This is a very, how do you see that whole thing working together, whether it's looking at what the federal government can bring and support, whether it's how to coordinate inside, you know, changes in how you in across, integrate across the agencies, you know, uh, the, the, you got the U.S. Geologic Survey, and you've got the, and you got the Ag 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 Research Service. How do we coordinate between those? Um, and you know, connections and feedback. When if things are going on in one agency, how does that get distributed to the other agencies or communicated down to the uh, local and state and tribal level? And you know, whether it's you know just the basic climate data. I mean, one of the things that vexes I think state and local and tribal governments sometimes that can we get the unified field theory of of data, you know, so so we 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 can have all right. This is a we're all going to buy into this kind of data set here uh, to help us plan. So I'm going to stop there, and I think if it's all right with you guys, I'll just ask you to respond or or fill in whatever you want to talk about on some of these things uh, in the order I just introduced you, if that's okay. So. Chavanda, you know, you get to uh, 
you get to set the tone and the, and the, and the, and where we go with that. So I'm turning it over to you. Uh, and thanks again for joining. Fantastic. And, um, and surely someone just started cutting grass. And so I hope you can't hear what I'm hearing from my office here at home. Who, who does that? Anyway, <laughs> I'm so happy to be with you all this morning to um, discuss a very important topic. Um, I'm currently serving as the uh, acting undersecretary for research, education, and economics in the Department of Agriculture. And um, I have served as the acting chief scientist since September of 2017, in addition to being head of the Agricultural Research Service. So I get a bird's eye view and a, a, a macro view of everything science in USDA. And you, you really touched upon a very important topic, collaboration, communication, communication, communication. I, mean, I think this was very evident this um, past year with COVID um, and everyone was looking around to see who was on first base and, and needing a, an opportunity to bring people together to have conversations. Well, we were able to do that in an emergency situation because we've been doing it all along on many different important topics like the one we're discussing today. Um, USDA has been a part of um, a lot of interagency activities around climate. Um, over the past four years in, included, we've continued to work on climate science and, um, and really be able to provide some of the important data and information that's important for decision making. Um, we have a great partnership with the Department of Interior because the Forest Service that sits inside of the Department of Agriculture receives its funding through the Department of Interior. And we all know how important our forests are to our climate change conversation. So we have a, a real strong partnership with the Department of Interior. I wanna give you just one example of a project or a, an initiative, a federal initiative that I think brings together many levels of government, um, including producers, um, consumers and other stakeholders. So in the USDA, ARS, in partnership with the Forest Service, has established 10 climate hubs across the country. And those climate hubs um, take the thousands of publications we put out each year around climate science. Um, so imagine you're a producer, he or she is not standing in their field trying to read the peer-reviewed journal of the day. Um, the climate hubs are responsible for taking all of that information and translating it into decision tools decision tools that producers and agriculture plays a huge role in the climate conversation that they can use to make informed decisions. Decisions about how much grazing um, um, land are they gonna have for their cattle this year? How much water are they gonna have in California? We know already that California is in drought again. Can we be predictive? We know that snow melt is important. Working with um, agencies like NOAA and NASA to use their satellite to build wonderful tools that help us predict and model. Um, the climate hubs have been a real um, a point of conversation. If you listen to Secretary Vilsack, Bob, if you heard him on yesterday, he probably mentioned the climate hubs a time or two. Um, and, and so we've been looking at how we can fortify those hubs to be able to be even more impactful um, to the United States. I would also say that uh, we have decades and decades and decades of data. Data alone is not the prize. It's what we do with the data that's going to enable us to be successful. And so we've been pulling together lots of big, big groups to come together to take that data and, and produce those tools we talked about, decision-making tools, predictive tools, and um, using um, techniques like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so from a scientist's perspective, we want to make sure that we provide all the data that's necessary and information for the best decision making and, and improve our resilience in agriculture. So I'll just stop there and, and pass it to um, pass it to my colleague, Scott. Well, thank all right. you very much. Um, really delighted to be with you all today. Uh, as Bob mentioned, the Interior Department uh, has about 65,000 employees in 2,400 locations around the country. We're not as big as USDA, on the other hand, we manage more real estate than ag. Uh, about more than 20% of the nation's real estate is managed by the Department of the Interior, mostly um, in, the, in the Western states. So I'll, I'd like to um, make a couple of observations. The first is a, around framing of the issue. So we've been talking a lot this week about climate change. I would suggest that 
perhaps we should take one step back and think about ecological sustainability. Climate change is part of ecological sustainability, but if we deal with the temperature issue and lose our ecosystems uh, because of invasive species, for instance, then we haven't accomplished a, a very much in, in terms of the biodiversity uh, on the planet as a whole and the sustainability of our ecosystems um, uh, across the planet. So the Interior Department and land managers more generally, I think have a very significant role in terms of dealing with both climate change and more broadly ecological sustainability. Uh, to put it in very simple terms, maybe borrowing uh, a, a, a phrase from Boris Johnson or, or uh, modifying his approach, dead trees can't fix carbon. And we have very significant forest health problems uh, across the country. We've had, over the last century, we've had waves of ecological disruption in our forest communities. We uh, lost our uh, chestnut forests. Uh, we've um, lost our elm forests, and uh, we are in the process of losing our ash forests, uh, thanks to in invasive species that I know USDA is very concerned about, the emerald ash borer. We've literally lost tens of millions of trees, uh, ash trees, uh, across the Midwest, and that problem is moving south and it's moving, uh, moving west. So on our rangeland ecosystems, we have tens of millions of acres that are infested by something called cheatgrass, which is an annual weed, dies early in the spring. It makes a really good fuel for wildfire. And sadly, um, uh, every year for the last several years, and the problem is increasing, frankly, year to year, we've been throwing an awful lot of carbon dioxide, not to mention uh, suspended particulates up in the air because of rangeland wildfire. So you know, even if we did away with all the uh, gasoline fueled uh, automobiles in California, if we've got massive uh, wildfire, we're throwing up uh, significant amounts of carbon uh, in, into the atmosphere. So in terms of what federal administrators uh, can, can do, I think uh, three considerations um, you know, come to mind. First is, uh, the geographic focus uh, of our institutions. Uh, at Interior over the last several years, uh, most of our bureaus have gone to shared regional boundaries, which means at least that our career SESers out in the field are looking at the exact same geographies, dealing with the same governors. So the, the geographic, having a common geographic focus uh, facilitates uh, conversations, it facilitates an understanding of what regional issues are. And my next point is, in fact, while we have a global problem with climate change and arguably uh, other ecological issues like invasive species, there are regional manifestations of that. And the regional manifestations vary immensely. The problems in New England are not the same as the problems in the Pacific Northwest or the Southeastern US or down in, in, in Florida. So the federal government can cooperate and to some extent, perhaps help the states organize themselves on a regional basis to deal with the regional manifestations of, that, of these problems. Uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest states and the Great Lakes states, uh, and to a lesser extent, the New England states have taken regional approach to various issues from, from time to time. But the federal government can support those regional efforts where they exist, and it can encourage states um, on, on a regional basis uh, to create regional coordination entities that may not exist right now. Uh, data, Shivandra mentioned data. Um, there are a couple of issues around data. Uh, everyone has a natural tendency to want to collect their own data. Well, unless you've got common data standards, you're not going to be able to share data and uh, data that's uh, collected in, in, in Maryland using one set of standards uh, can't be used in Virginia if Virginia is using a different set of standards to try to get an overall perspective on the Chesapeake Bay, for instance. So having common data standards, which is something the federal government can facilitate um, together with regional state organizations like the Western Governors As Association is one mechanism for making sure that the data that's generated is actually 
usable by all the parties who may have an interest in that particular uh, geography. Um, similarly, scale uh, of, uh, of analysis um, is, is important. Um, global level models on precipitation are not going to help um, Oregon and California deal with water supply issues in the Klamath River Basin. Uh, global models uh, on, uh, on, uh, on snow versus um, wet precipitation are not going to help the states in the Colorado River Basin figure out what the likely elevation of Lake Mead is going to be next year, which may trigger whether or not the Secretary of Interior has to declare a shortage, which cuts back water supply to the state of Arizona and the state of Nevada, for instance. So the scale of information is, is important. And having information on a regional scale that's actionable for the problems as it defined on, on a regional basis, uh, I, I'd suggest is an important thing that the federal government uh, can help uh, facilitate. Um, I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that a renewable energy is not synonymous necessarily with environmentally benign um, energy. For instance, uh, depending upon the wind technology that's used, uh, you can kill a lot of birds and you can kill a lot of bats. Uh, they are important components in our, in our ecosystems. So one needs to um, be thoughtful about what the secondary and, and perhaps even tertiary, tertiary implications might be of a particular management decision. That's not easy, uh, but uh, we need to at, at least challenge ourselves to, to look at what the secondary implications may be of some of the policy decisions. So uh, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thanks, Scott. Um, that was a good good uh, entry there and uh, and I, I appreciate those particularly those last comments the whole I mean if there if ever, if all the cars are going to have electric motors whether it's a fuel cell or a battery that's giving it its power there's a lot of copper um, so that you know we had a lot of aluminum a lot of steel in the in the internal combustion engines so uh, you know these supply chain things don't disappear uh, but they they need to be managed um, so James, I'm going to turn to you now, uh, and uh, um, you know, really, how, how is all this starting to look? You know, as we transition in the administration uh, to the work that you guys have to do—that's so important at the local level. But also, how are you thinking in the future? What should we be pushing? So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bob and Scott and Shabona for uh, putting a, a great deal of context into. Um, this issue, and you know, I'm here as a local government official. I have worked at the state and federal government in the past, but I really feel uh, comfortable now in the position uh, of working for a large urban county. We have uh, 2.7 million people in uh, 34 cities, and um, it's a uh, it, it has been focused on the issues we've been talking about this morning. I, I would say we're thrilled now to see this renewed interest starting uh, across the board in the, in the new administration, uh, the people are being appointed, uh, the interest in Congress. Uh, there have been times when that hasn't been there, uh, either in our state capital or other state capitals uh, or in Washington. And I think in, in that uh, evolving vacuum, local government has filled in the, the, uh, the spots and try to organize to face these issues. And speaking now directly from our experience, as Bob, you referred to in Southeast Florida, for the last 10 years, uh, four counties here, uh, Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, uh, Florida Keys, have been organized as the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. Compact has proved very successful at keeping this at a, uh, uh, a, a nonpartisan issue, as Bob referred to, uh, and, and also um, at a peer-to-peer -peer level, being able to share the things that the counties were all addressing separately. Uh, one of the most important examples really goes to data, as Scott was saying, and it is how do we use in a day-to-day -day basis the, the modeling data and projections for uh, this specific impact of climate change, sea level rise. 
which is a direct impact to our region. There's different impacts in other places in the country. But for us, we realized that just using the International Panel for Climate Change or even the National Climate Assessment projections, it, it wasn't refined enough for us to work on it. And maybe even most and more importantly, the messengers weren't right. So that comp the compact has uh, created a scientific panel locally that can draw on all that international and national uh, projections and data. And every five years, we, we issue a, a uh, regional projection of sea level rise. And I can tell you almost uniformly that is used by all the counties uh, when the Corps of Engineers arrives to do a study, we, we hand them that report and say, this is the sea level rise projection for this region. We'd like for you to use it. It doesn't look that much different than the ones that have been modeled at, uh, at the national level, but it has the, uh, the messengers are our local scientists in our universities, working at local government level and, and uh, federal scientists who were fortunate enough to have housed here at NOAA and, and the national parks. So that makes a big difference who those messengers are on this climate data. And that exercise of, of uh, operating that regionally uh, has been a great success story, which we gladly share uh, with others. For drilling down to uh, a large urban county and how we look at climate change, we took advantage of a program that the Rockefeller Foundation pioneered uh, several years ago called 100 Resilient Cities. And together with our cities produced a resilient 305 strategy, 305 being the dominant phone area code for the, uh, and that strategy is, goes back to that term, Bob, of resilience. It's not just a climate plan. It takes climate, a very important element of both looking at mitigation and adaptation and puts it with other shocks and stresses that our community have experienced or will in the future. Uh, our plan, even uh, interesting enough, after we had an outbreak of Zika virus, uh, uh, mosquito-borne, uh, two years ago, we said we had to be aware of pandemic uh, activities in the future. We didn't know uh, that we would experience what the whole world is experiencing, but we had that, we had it in a broad, uh, comprehensive strategy, which allowed us to shift uh, and pivot into those focus areas. So that broad resilient 305 strategy allows us to look at adaptation, climate change and equity and resource allocation uh, in a more comprehensive way. I would say also in that same context, the partnerships that we created in that uh, original 100 resilient cities program uh, are now uh, stand as the 97 cities uh, worldwide that are part of the resilient cities network. And that group, uh, along with others, recently issued a Resilience 21 uh, agenda, which we've shared in Washington, which I think takes the same approach. Uh, and just yesterday, uh, the mayor of Houston, who is the chair of the board of that uh, Resilient Cities Network, uh, tasked all of us to, to focus on resilient infrastructure that had equitable outcomes in our communities. And that will be a focal point for us going forward. So I appreciate the chance to give that background. All right, well, that's, that's good. Uh, so I'm gonna, now th those are good framings and, and really identifying some of the, the key issues. And uh, Tavanda, the, you know, going back to you, I mean, you mentioned all the work that you've done and you're currently doing at USDA during the, as, as things are moving forward with the new administration. But, but in the past, you've also, done a stint in the White House, um, try, you know, where, you know, in theory, a lot of people point to and say, we need more, we need more coordination. Uh, you know, so it's like a two-edged sword, I think, sometimes for people in the agency. So I'm going to have, the, I'm going to come at this in two different directions. First, I'm going to say, ask each of you, you know, what, we've all talked about it. We, it's in our report. You've all mentioned it. Is there something that you and I recognize you're you're in the system now, Javanda. Uh, so you, and we won't put you horribly on the phone. You know, if, if Secretary Velsack would just do, you know, I know that you won't say that. So the, uh, so um, 
but but at a high level for for all your experiences both at USDA and and looking uh, you know at the broader issues from the White House, um, what are some of the, what are the things that could be done to try to facilitate all of this coordination and collaboration? Is there something missing? Is it is it a culture thing? Is it a structural thing? As public administrators, what do we think? Uh, uh, would be uh, something that uh, going forward, administrations, whether this current one or future ones, should be doing to, to make facilitate this even further? A number of those things are already happening, which is great. Um, throughout my 19 years in USDA, two of those spent in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, you know, serving in that coordinating um, capacity, those, th those coordinations have been extremely important. Um, the National Science and Technology Council um, has been a key part of bringing the federal agencies together to have those conversations. Um, over the last four years, we haven't had as much interaction as we typically have had in government, and I'm happy to see a number of those activities being um, sort of rejuvenated. I um, mean, you, you've heard the president announce a number of task force that he um, is appointing. I'm a member of a number of the of the task force that have been put in place around different topics like supply chain and the jobs package. And the, the big thing is that career people are being asked what we think. And that is um, and that is very refreshing to be able to be a part of those conversations as they um, work towards meeting work toward meeting their goal. So domestically, you know, I think it's critically important that the DO, for me, DOE, Department of Interior, um, you know, NASA, NOAA, we're always talking because we have so much overlap and um, I would say uh, codependence uh, to be successful. So we have to work together. So it's a, it's a necessity that we work together. I'm also a part of an, um, the G20, Meeting of the Agriculture Chief Scientists. And I just want to share with you that it's critically important that we work together internationally as well. And so um, let me just tell you about a, a, an initiative that we co-chaired with, with Canada for the G20 um, countries. And it's, um, it's, a, it, it's built on the long-term agroecosystem research network that we have inside of ARS. I talked about the climate hubs earlier, but we have 18 ecosystems across the country where we run common, common experiments. So being able to test a uh, climate smart um, practice on 18 different ecosystems and being able to compare those ecosystems with all of the other variables being kept um, the same. Now imagine and envision the ability to do that globally, to be able to, 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 to have a common experiment uh, with the G20 countries. And so we're very excited about that partnership. And sometimes it just means stepping into the gap where you see a need to bring people together and just making it happen. Because if we wait, that's not always going to be, um, it's somebody else's it's somebody else's responsibility. So um, I've really appreciated the opportunity to be a part of a number of those groups. And I just suggest that we keep bringing the right people around the table. Yeah, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna riff on that for a second because when I was, um, and there's you know, people like Stan Myberg who are on the call here who did this as well. When I was the deputy at EPA, and even back in the Clinton administration when I was an assistant administrator, the best advice I ever got was bring in the career leaders, the career experts, and make sure that they um, own, they, they, they have enough participation that they own the, the direction you want to go into and and you can go in those directions a lot faster and then I think that's true cross cross agency not just inside uh, you know each agency but I you brought you brought that up several times Ivana, and I think it's really it's really you know for for public administration officials it, it's really a key a key thing is to get I mean, this is almost like managing a diverse and expert workforce is they have to they have to feel like they're part of of the um solution and that they're that they've had input into the direction to go in and then they, then they'll go faster so i i i want to just i just wanted to reemphasize that point can i give um, you an example sure sure the, the, the climate hubs were stood up under secretary vilsack 
um, when he was in his first um, term as uh, Secretary of Agriculture. They were so impactful. They included the career service. And when he left, when he's back now, and he can see they're even greater than when he established them. And what, what, what's important is that the career people owned it. We knew, right. we knew it was important. It was having impact. And so we fought to keep them supported. And so that's why it's, it's really important to have that buy-in. We, we're going to support the administration's initiatives. And we just want to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's certainly been my, my experience as a, as, a, as a manager in the federal government. Uh, so we're, we're trying to look here at, you know, what are some of the impediments and what can we do? And, and uh, you know, we just had the conversation with Jolanda, but uh, Scott, uh, from, you know, uh, an agency that is spread around, uh, you know, in, in, at the, at, in the parks, uh, in the Bureau of Land Management, uh, you know, the, all the different uh, parts of DOE have their own regional and uh, structure. Uh, what, what did you see there in your time and what would you recommend, uh, you know, as a way to make collaboration even better? Um, thanks, Bob. So uh, at Interior, as I mentioned, over the last three or four years, most of our bureaus went to shared geographic boundaries. So you really do have a situation now where the, the regional directors are looking at the exact same states, uh, if you will, which really helps in their bureau coordination. And in addition, within uh, each one of the now dozen standard regions at Interior, one of those career SES or regional directors has been designated as sort of the first among equals or coordinator in chief or communicator in chief, convener in chief to uh, corral uh, his or her colleagues around uh, various issues of, of, of mutual interest. So uh, that has, has worked very well um, uh, at Interior. It uh, was a, especially obviously beneficial during COVID um, in some cities in the West, we might have an office building where four or five different interior bureaus have a floor each. And it would obviously be a real problem if the employees on the third floor were told, everybody go telework. Employees one floor up were told, everybody come to work. Um, so having the, the regional coordination um, uh, mechanisms uh, what dramatically proved itself uh, during COVID, but it's more, more applicable generally uh, on water issues across um, those regions, on uh, forest issues, on invasive species issues. At the national level, um, I think the administration can leverage uh, some of the tools in GIPRA and GIPRA MA to focus the executive branch uh, agencies. I'm not a fan of a lot of reporting, I'm not, but the, the reality of the situation, I saw this firsthand uh, during the last four years, is uh, agency senior leadership does really pay attention to agency priority goals. And as long as they're not too many of them, uh, having to sit in front of the deputy secretary once a quarter and explain what progress of three or four different assistant secretaries that made on a particular issue is a powerful way to focus attention and to, to generate results. So expanding that uh, one level out, I think the administration uh, can make some really interesting decisions on cross agency priority goals. And as long as there are a manageable number of those, like 10, as opposed to 30, as opposed to 60, I think the White House can use those cross-agency priority goals as a tool for corralling all the deputy secretaries or all the deputy administrators who have a particular interest in a, a policy or administrative um, area. Um, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, I worked at the Office of Management and Budget for seven years. So I'm a, and at one point I was your budget examiner in the Office of Water, Bob, you may remember. I do. <laughs> so, uh, OMB has um, a significant uh, ability to get the attention, let's say, of, 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 of federal agencies in a way that CEQ or CEA uh, or OSTP can't because the agencies realize, well, yeah. OMB is approving our budgets, 
They're clearing our regulations. They're controlling what we say in testimony before Congress next week. So having OMB as part of a, an interagency team, if you will, uh, guarantees active participation. And I would dare say maybe slightly more adherence to the policy direction of the, uh, of the administration than might be the case where OMB not in the room, not uh, at, at the table. Two practical examples of that. Um, you recall, Bob, we, we worked on a wetlands policy during the Clinton administration and also right before that during the Bush administration. And CEQ had the, the, the lead, but OMB was already always at the table. You know, I was literally always in the room. And yeah. that worked really well. You got half a dozen different agencies focused. Um, and uh, frankly, having OMB at the table means you're more likely to deliver on the budgetary implications of whatever policy decisions that interagency group comes up with. So I just want to offer those thoughts. All right. Well, uh, I'll riff on that just for 30 seconds here and say, you know, where Shavonda mentioned, you know, really uh, bringing in the career scientists and career managers, people who have tons of experience, they, they really are um, obliged, you know, particularly if they're in the senior executive service to, to, to focus on support. Uh, but they, they, if, if you want it to be there, you, you really have to get them involved. You're bringing up another really important point, And one I realized right away, although I don't know that I, I think Stan may have perfected it maybe after me, but I at least thought about it. And that is, you know, we all have to respond under the Government Performance and Results Act. We all have to feed the beast, as they say, down in the, down in the troops. Uh, so why not put that FTE that are working on that to the kind of use you're talking about? You know, as opposed to just making, instead of just punching the clock, you know, let's get this to be actually, you know, spending all this FTE time on doing it, let's get it to be something meaningful. And I like the idea of cross-agency ones that maybe OMB would keep a, you know, would help keep a track of and everything. So, you know, again, the, the high level concept there is use the existing resources that you already, and, and processes that you already have to work in as a federal manager, use those existing things, adjust the knobs to accomplish your goals. I think that that's a really uh, important message there. Um, now, uh, James, you obviously don't have to deal with the Government Performance and Results Act, but you may be abused by it and you don't even know. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, the one thing I, I'd like you to add to the flavor of this, and, and it's, it's a question that one of our participants added, so I'm gonna start blending some of those questions in, is, is you know, working uh, in Southeast Florida, you're gonna be working with a lot of different federal agencies, regional offices, and Scott started to broach this subject. How much, how much do you think from your perspective can be balanced between delegating the authority to work on these matters uh, to like the EPA Atlanta office or to you know, the Everglades office that Interior has and, and you know, um, yeah. I, you know, there's this delegation issue and uh, you know, if you're trying to get something done, you got to go through the regional office, then you have to wait for them to get a decision from the federal, the national office. Does that seem like a, uh, there's, there's some opportunity there from your perspective? So I'll, yeah, I've got two examples, Bob, I'd like to use them. You just alluded to one and that's Everglades. Look, um, all local governments, we're, we're interested right now in building things. You know, we need to build structures, renovate structures, we need to, uh, adjust to a rising sea or riverine flooding or whatever it is. And in many cases, we can't do that without the federal government. And uh, since the year 2000, um, we benefited from a federal ecosystem restoration task force in Southeast Florida, not just for our corner of the peninsula, but for the whole Southern end from Orlando South. It encompasses the Everglades and the coral reefs and an urban area of 8 million people. And I think it's been very successful, uh, but it's an instructive on how we got there. You know, we had to do a specific amendment in the Water Resources Development Act of 2000 to create something that you couldn't create because of federal law. And we had to go around the 
Federal Advisory Committee Act. If there's one good thing you guys could do is get rid of FACA. But, but we, had to, we had to go around that in order to create the very thing that you're uh, alluding to at, at different levels. And because we have that, that doesn't change law. That doesn't mean that EPA isn't uh, still uh, the agency required to look at water quality or the Corps isn't doing the structural work or interior isn't trying to protect endangered species and working with the tribes. We have everybody on that task force uh, council and they produce the data and we have a contract with the National Academy of Sciences that every two years they give us a peer review. And in that 20 years, we've gone from not talking about climate change to where the last report from the National Academy was, you need to restudy some of the issues you originally looked at because of climate change. Yeah. Uh, to pull that over to something that's not working, and I'm hoping that whoever gets appointed the Assistant Secretary of the Civil Works and the, and the Department of the Army will look at this. The authorization process for the Corps on most of the flooding projects is is a disaster for the local governments. Those authorizations look at just one component of flooding. They don't look at compound flooding. And it changed the whole process into a kind of a, a game of trying to meet those requirements uh, at the same time knowing that you need to do much more to protect your community. So that's an example of something that's working for us that the federal government helped us create and something that really needs some work uh, if we're going to make progress to deal with some of these issues in the future. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the local, uh, the local core office, uh, the colonel, usually it's a colonel level, uh, sometimes it's a brigadier general level, uh, that in, in the army who's, who's head those, heads those re regional core offices, but, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that can be done in that arena. So I, I'm, um, uh, um, so the, you know, the question is, should, should, you know, here's a case where I think you're, you're seeing that there probably needs some national leadership, you know, with the new assistant secretary for civil works to, you know, motivate the military arm of the Corps of Engineers to think, think outside their normal their normal box and and so um but then once they get do that you know obviously you got to get the work done at that at that local district engineer uh place um you know so um i'm happy to circle around with scott or chavanda about this delegation issue also it seemed most relevant to james but but i think going back to you guys and the the array of things you know there there's a balance here you know how much do you control control at the top or you know or in the white house or how much the, can you delegate and it it seems to me and i just some quick feedback from the two of you it seems to me that you know the, the the headquarters whether it's the whether it's the secretary's office or the 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 um under secretaries or the white house somebody has to set the the, the major the high level parameters under which you know, you know, you have some degree of consistency within the regional variation of what what would be applied to decision making. But um, anyway, I, I I think it's a worthwhile to, from both both a DOI and a USDA perspective uh, the issue of delegation, how you guys have been dealing with it, and what you think about it. So um, I I've been in or around the Interior Department for forty years or so. And I, I've seen the, the a pendulum swing three or four times. Uh, at, at one, and centralization creates problems. Regionalization uh, creates problems. Uh, and uh, typically, what happens is once the problems are manifested in one, you swing all the way over to the other until you start getting some bad results in that, and then you, you, you swing backward. So, you know, with, with regionalization, the, the problem is headquarters can lose control over, over policy and, and, and direction. Uh, with centralization, uh, you get decisions made in headquarters that don't make any sense out there in the, in the real world because of, of, of regional variations. I think the improvements that we've gotten in terms of access to data and access to technology in the last several years 
make the risk of regionalization less because headquarters can get more visibility through data and reporting uh, on what's going on out there um, uh, in, in the regions. Um, so I think there is less risk with deferring to regional career SESers doing their own thing um, than, than you know, there might have been 10 or, or, or 20 years ago, um, for instance. One, I think, interesting artifact of uh, going to standard regions at the Interior Department and uh, having those regional directors talk to each other more frequently is that there are fewer disagreements that get bumped up to Washington. Uh, you get, you know, so when you have a situation where you've got a phone call with the deputy secretary and the, and the secretary, and you can say, look, the regional director of Bureau of Reclamation and the BLM state director and the Fish and Wildlife Service regional director and the Park Service regional director and the BIA regional director all think we ought to do thing X. Uh, then you put the secretary in, in a spot of either concluding that he or she is smarter than the collective uh, you know, uh, in, intelligence out there of the regional leadership or they simply endorse it. So uh, we've discovered that there's been a, a bit of a sh power shift from Washington to the regions because the regional directors have figured out if they can work things out on a regional level among themselves and present a common front to Washington, then Washington is more likely than not to go along with what they come up with, as opposed to the old model of, I don't like what my colleague is doing, I'll bump it up to my assistant secretary and they'll fight it out in Washington. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny because I, I think I'm Washington. Um, but it, in any case, <laughs> when it gets bumped up and they say, whoa. So, you know, in, I'll, I'll just use ARS as an example because I have a lot of experience with the Agriculture Research Service. So Jim, we have a number of locations in um, Florida. For example, I have one right there in Miami, one in Fort yeah. Lauderdale and Fort Pierce, Canal Point. So the, the reason I bring that up is because we have some 136 sites and locations across the country. So here in Beltsville, Maryland, about 18 miles from here, we do all of the national priority setting. It, it all happens here. And then the implementation happens in those 136 locations where we work with stakeholders so closely. And so everything we do is informed by stakeholders across the country. We have something called March Madness, which we did virtually this year, it's not basketball. <laughs> It's where every stakeholder group known to man comes in to tell me and my leadership team what are their highest priorities. Um, speaking to on behalf of their regions and, and, and they've also worked with all of our local leadership and regional leadership. And so then we have the hard job of taking all of that and turning it into national programs and being responsive. Um, Jim, I think about um, the, uh, is it the key deer? Is it uh, what they, are they yes, called? Key deer? Yes, ma'am. And there, there's a key yeah. deer refuge that Interior has in the Florida Keys. It, and so we had the screw worm that re, re, you know, re reared its head, unfortunately. So that we have the beauty of government infrastructure research is that we've never stopped our research on screw worms. Although people forgot about screw worms because we eradicated it in the United States, we've been busy helping the rest of the world get rid of their screw worms so they don't bring it back into the United States. So when Florida had their issue, we were able to come together as the local state and federal government and quickly eradicate the issue again. We, we flew in millions of uh, sterile flies from Panama. Yep, I remember I this. Sent, I sent my scientists down to Florida and we were able based on our experience to quickly help you guys get rid of it again. Um, and what, what was important is that because we had not had screw worms in 34 years, nobody recognized what exactly was happening in the beginning because it's like, what is this? And then once it was clear, these are, these are screw worms, you know, we knew exactly what to do. And, um, and so that's why it's important for us to have these relationships, you know, between federal agencies, between state agency and local agencies and be able to recognize where the resources are to deal with the challenge. So we're a matrix organization. 
uh, between planning and implementation, it, it causes natural tension, but it keeps us all honest. And so um, I think that uh, it's, it's certainly something that I, I, I appreciate in working with all of the land grant university systems. So um, yeah, so that's just an example where I, I think you, if you have a little bit of both, I agree with you, Scott, don't swing all the way one side or the other, but have a little bit of both. I think that's the best way. And yeah, it's tough, but it keeps us at the table talking. Shivana, we have a Python problem. Can you help us with that? Now you got me stumped, Jim. <laughs> so that's a the invasive species is another whole another whole conversation. But, um, well, again, I mean, for the audience, what we're talking, we you know, the 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 the, the academy has talked about these issues: stewardship of natural resources and dealing with climate change, both from a mitigation and resilience perspective, as requiring important collaboration in the federal government with local and state government. And what we're here now is actual practitioners, people who are currently still in it, <laughs> two like myself and Scott, who were recently in it, um, you know, where um, we're really looking at you know, what are the what are the details under the hood there? You know, the career staff, the regional offices, the back and forth. And, and there's no right answer here. There's no like, well, it should be more over here, it should be less over there. Um, and it really, I, I mean, you know, if you factor in scientific integrity, Savanda, you may want even less, you know, so these are the areas we want to study, but we're not going to tell you, you know, how to how to deal with it. So, um, but what you're hearing here is a conversation on, on the truly difficult and, but also very challenging and fun when you're in it, uh, issues that have to be dealt with and trying to make the collaboration happen. And I think that's really important. I wanna remind folks that um, we have some time for questions. Uh, I know I've been, this regionalization question uh, was something that originated in one of the uh, one of the participants' questions. Um, but I, you know, feel free to drop a question and in into the into the into the chat because I have one more um, question uh, that I want to ask the panelists from my my thing. But I'm from my perspective. But I'm I'm anxious to and desire to build in any any comments from the from the audience as well. So the last one I want to for me directly that I want to ask the three of you is, is something that we alluded to in our report. And it's, a, it's also alluded to as some of the other reports that the uh, Academy put together under the, under the broad 12 grand challenges. And that is uh, building uh, equity and justice into some of the permitting work. You know, is this, I mean, you could take the look that this is another whole thing that gets uh, layered on top and how do we deal with that? Or you can look at it as it's something that, why don't we just start building it in from the bottom? So it just, it's just part of the, part of the process. And I, I'm guessing that, I mean, obviously what I just said, you can tell which one I think is probably the way to do it, but, but uh, you know, that's not, it's easier said than done. And so I'm sure that um, at, at least, uh, uh, at least now, uh, those of you who are still in there, not me, uh, are, are starting to figure this out or try to figure this out. And I think it's worth having a little bit of a, a thought, a couple of thoughts from all of you on this part of the uh, growing uh, interest. And so again, um, since agriculture begins with an A, I'll start with you, Javon. <laughs> Always be first. I, I, right. I, I do want to tell you that both Scott and I did go to a land grant college. I believe you went to the land grant part of Cornell. We both went to the Cornell Ag School. So oh, fantastic. We, we may pretend to not know anything about agriculture, but actually we do. <laughs> so. Fantastic. I was just with, with Dr. Catherine Bohr all day yesterday, who used to be the dean there. Um, so let me just say, you know, the 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 focus and emphasis on equity by this administration is refreshing. And, um, you know, as the chief scientist, acting chief scientist and head of a science agency, you know, we think about equity in a number of different ways. And of course, science is supposed to be sort of, you, like you said, nonpartisan this morning. It's really be, supposed to be somewhere in the middle on most things. And, you know, our secretary um, challenged all of us to be thinking about 
how we can do exactly what you talked about, Bob, is integrating equity in our programs from the beginning. You know, not layering it on top, but how do we rethink how we do our program, even in science? And so think, for example, if we fund, um, if we, we contribute a, a large portion of our budget to a certain, say, crop, and the high percentage of those um, producers are non-minority or in the majority, we have already sort of tipped the balance. And so how do we expand the breadth of our programs to be more um, cognizant of the needs of, say, small farmers, minority farmers, um, Native American um, farmers? And how do we just redesign and rethink about how we um, implement our programs and what we include and prioritize in our programs. And so it was just really interesting to me, interesting to me as a scientist, as an African-American female, you can think, you know, and I think equity, I think about how do we make sure we continue to diversify the faces around the table and my scientists throughout the agency. It just didn't click to me about how I need to also re-envision my programming. I've already tipped the scale if I invest a multitude of the funding into certain areas that don't help lift all farmers. So yeah, so it's just an example that I think has been important for us as we um, have this opportunity to support President Biden's initiatives and something we all care about and that's equity. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Uh, Scott, do you have a, some points you wanna put yeah, in on this? Yeah, a couple of points uh, I, I, I want to make. Um, the, the, the first of all, um, as a, a former Trump political appointee, I want to give the Biden administration credit in that Secretary Holland at Interior uh, in the skinny budget uh, proposed huge budget increases for Indian country. And uh, across the, the nation, as a, as a generalization, our Indian communities are among the poorest with some of the worst medical problems, some of the worst social problems of anywhere in, in our society. So, you know, kudos to the to the president and, and, and Secretary Holland for putting their, their their money where their rhetoric is, if you will, and proposing uh, very significant budget increases for, uh, for for Indian country in the president's 22 budget. Um, so that's one thing I, I wanted to mention. Uh, in, in most of Interior's activity, most of, of Interior's land, uh, not surprisingly, uh, as in rural areas of the country. And uh, rural communities tend not to be as wealthy as urban communities, as a generalization. It's not always true. And obviously, there's some urban areas that are, are really economically disadvantaged. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to, to think about um, to what extent does Interior and or, or the Forest Service, which is a you know, major land manager uh, over at USDA, uh, defer to the needs, the priorities, the concerns of the local communities that are affected by land management decisions, as opposed to um, making policy decisions based on where the votes are, uh, if you will, which tend to be in the larger urban areas, which, which tend to be richer. Um, so that I think will be, uh, you know, an interesting thing to watch. And uh, there, there's no simple uh, solution there, but uh, that's, a, that's a dynamic that uh, has been a, a challenge for decades. You know, there are more votes in New York City and in Los Angeles than there are in the uh, all the Rocky Mountain states, you know, put together. If you take out LA, if you take out Phoenix and, and Las Vegas, for instance. Yeah. Well, uh, that that very issue came up with the vote yesterday on the District of Columbia becoming the 51st state. I, I, I actually have a I actually have an American flag in the closet over here that has 51 stars on it. I, <laughs> I'm not sure where it came from, uh, James. Yeah, uh, where, where, how are you uh, thinking well, about that? You know, Bob, I, I work for a uh, elected mayor countywide. She's the CEO, Mayor Levine Kava. She's just come into office. One of the things she did was you know, directly out of her office, uh, she set up an office of equity and engagement, uh, and that's aimed specifically at 
the issues that we've all seen on TV and are struggling with day to day at the local level. Uh, we have a lar the eighth largest police force in the country that directly reports to her. And she, she is aware of those interactions that happen in, in our frontline communities. And, and that one bad accident or incident can be, you know, have ramifications. We're also a county, uh, the population of which 60% of our residents were born in another country. So we are directly uh, involved in the movement of international people. We just signed on to a, the mayor's migration compact, a, a statement that was made at, at the time of, the, of this climate administration, because we already get climate refugees. Uh, we get them when there are, you know, uh, hurricanes and major uh, events in the uh, island communities that are connected to our uh, urban area. Uh, and we expect to see them in the future because they're even more vulnerable to the impacts that, that we deal with. So I think the equity issue is really part and parcel of what we do. Uh, the last point I'd make is, you know, we're every local government is uniquely interested in real estate values and property because it drives, in most cases, parts of your local government budget. Uh, and it's especially important for our state and local communities since we don't have an income tax. So we're, we're experiencing something called climate um, gentrification, where, where property that was uh, historically occupied by uh, frontline communities, vulnerable, uh, uh, areas and where immigrants came, we have areas like Little Haiti uh, and Little Jamaica. Uh, they're on high, relatively high land in South Florida. And if you're a real estate uh, investor or speculator, which we, we have our share of, uh, then you're looking away from those vulnerable coastal areas towards the, those very places that are occupied by our vulnerable communities. So that's a whole other equation maybe a little unique to us, but that, that whole question of this displacing uh, vulnerable, low-income communities because of real estate value transactions is something we do with all the time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, at where I currently work at the Center for uh, Climate and Energy Solutions, we did a report uh, late last year on um, looking at this interfacing of, of regional competitive economic competitiveness and resilience. And we looked at three industries, James, uh, the real estate industry, the, um, the bond rating industry, um, and the, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, the loans and, and uh, other financial instruments, the insurance industry. And um, all three of those industries are gearing up nationally, in the larger re, you know, re, uh, real, uh, larger real estate and, and insurers, as well as locally, they're all gearing up to be looking more carefully at these risks. So it's going to create, um, it's going to create uh, some issues. Now we have a, a question here, which I think I, I mentioned at the beginning, this issue of, of transition particularly to fossil fuel um, uh, focused, I, I'm not gonna call it dependent, but focused communities. And this goes from uh, you know, a small town in the Ohio River Valley that 30% of the tax base comes from a coal fire power plant. And that coal fire power plant is slated to be closed because it's being outcompeted by natural gas. You know, the coal fire power plant has shift work in it. You know, dozens of people on the shift, uh, the, the gas turbine, uh, can be run remotely by somebody's computer, you know, wherever they may be, you know, I mean, and then you have maybe somebody on a, a circuit route that might stop by for maintenance or if something happens, they can go there. So you've got a very different uh, situation evolving there uh, in, in a town like that. And if the plant closes and their tax base goes down and where do they, how do they support schools, fires and everything else, then you have larger geographies, let's say like uh, Appalachia or uh, Wyoming, which was one of the specific questions, you know, which is um, very, uh, and Alaska too, you can look at Alaska, where resource extraction, particularly fossil fuel resource extraction, had been a part of their economy and a major part of their economy, you know, since they became a state. And so, um, 
So this transition that's happening, whether it's cheaper natural gas and displacing coal, or you know, perhaps uh, regulatory pushes to push even natural gas to a lower level, although there's a lot of research going back to research, Devon, Shavanda, but the, um, not at the USDA, but at DOE, and we don't have DOE Department of Energy with us here, but um, a lot of research on how to make sure that those kinds of uh, power generators can be uh, accommodated in a low carbon economy with carbon capture technologies and other kinds of, of technology. So there's a technology race uh, to uh, keep our um, fuel portfolio balance, but at the same time, there's a need and, 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 the, uh, and, and the commenter writes, and I'm familiar with this. I, had, I actually, when I was at EPA, I met with gov the former governor, Matt Mead, about the work that they were doing there, looking at how to diversify the economy of Wyoming. Uh, you know, obviously they have great wind resources, which is one thing, but we really need a bigger picture and that's what they're doing. So this, this comes under a broad category these days called just transition, you know, because it's not just dealing with the vulnerable communities, but it's also looking at where, uh, where economy is changing and, and going. So, um, you know, just any thoughts the panelists have, I mean, I'm riffing on this question that came up. I think what's needed um, is not just like job training, you know, let's train everybody to install solar panels. I mean, what's needed is an economic development plan and the federal government as a partner for these parts of the geography in the country where these transitions we can predict will happen. At the same time, focusing on investing, and, and I think some of the budgets that have recently come out, investing in some of the technologies that we need to accelerate, get them out of the what they call the valley of death of being tried and tried and tried, and get them into the commercialization. So um, we're going to need that. The world is going to need that. The world's going to be using fossil fuels, even if we can reduce the amount that we do. And I think, I think getting ourselves to a net zero by the middle of the century does not mean not having any fossil fuels involved, but it, but if the, to the extent fossil fuels are involved, they have to have uh, controls on them of some kind or another that will reduce their carbon carbon impact. And and again, there's a lot of stuff going on in this right now. Um, you know, so a cement plant in is building a carbon capture facility in Wyoming. I'm, I'm sorry, in, in in Colorado, and so um, a lot is going on. But I'm going to ask the panel if they have any questions on this side of this transition issue. I mean, the same thing could be said perhaps in some of the farming communities as well. Yeah, well, you know, um, the Biden administration has really put an emphasis in, in Secretary Vilsack on clean energy and climate change. So they're not, the, you know, they both, they're, they're two different focus areas that have a lot of overlap in how we, we meet the need. Um, you know, I, I came to government working on bio-based products and bioenergy. Um, back in the early 2000s, and it, and, um, and and I have seen this area ebb and flow as we have moved through based on the price of you know different um, uh, energy sources. Um, one of the things that we're focusing on right now, and we've been working with the Department of Energy for a, an extremely long period of time, is on bioenergy and bio-based products. And one of the things I'm really excited about is the sustain, sustainable aviation fuels. And the, and the airline industry has created a customer because what happens is if we don't have a pool, we need a pool. And the airline industry has made some, um, some, some, some um, let me just say, ch some charges to themselves that they want to be uh, more environmentally friendly. And I think, the, I think that they said they wanted to be net zero by 2030. This is the airline industry. And we know how much fuel the airline industry um, uses. So if we in, in, in agriculture can find a way to help them meet that goal by partnering with the Department of Energy and others, then you have a customer. So there is a pool for some of this. And so you can't have biofuels without biomass. And so how do you then turn that into an economic opportunity for some of these rural communities and areas that need, you know, to that need to be able to pivot into something else. And so um, that's that's what the way I look at it from a scientific perspective, and I'm sure in many parts of USDA, from some of the programming and regulatory and policy making sides, you would hear another component of this. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, this is a, there's an analogy there, uh, Chavando, to involving the involving the career 
leaders in, in decision making, what you're talking about is, you know, involving the ag community broad in helping devise solutions, but there's got to be science behind it because it has to actually, we have to sequester the stuff, we have to make the, use the biofuels so we're balancing food and food and fiber that we need there. Um, but so there's a big science component to that as well. But once once farmers, ranchers, and foresters see uh, the economic value of farming or or harvesting in, in a certain way that on 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 average, you know, sequesters more carbon than is released, uh, and that there's a market for that, you're going to see practices change very quickly. <laughs> so I think that's just a it, it's a really good point to make uh, that, that uh, you know, the, the direct air capture, whether it's by biology or mechanical is another piece of, of balancing out. Scott or, or James, do you guys have anything here as we uh, wrap up on, this is on the transition issues. Right, I think, um, I think it's a very real point that you've made, Bob. And I know in the international trade world at one point, there was economic assistance grants, I think, to communities or local governments, if you know all the jobs through um, had, had moved to Mexico or had, or had moved internationally, and, and local communities lost a lot of jobs. Well, I think there are there are real um, economic and therefore real political risks uh, for some states like Wyoming, like West Virginia, and and others. Uh, for instance, uh, there in in. Arizona, there was a large coal-fired power plant called the Navajo Generating Station. And a combination of market factors, natural gas being so abundant and so cheap, and public utility regulatory commission decisions on being in the coal business anymore, led to the closing of that Navajo Generating Station and the associated coal mine. Well, the royalties on that coal mine produced 40% of the income of the Hopi tribe's local government. So all of a sudden, the local government's taken a 40% budget cut. Uh, and that's completely un unsustainable. So I think I would suggest that one of the things Congress might want to look at as part of climate change legislation at some point is uh, softening the blow to local governments that are dependent upon a royalty uh, revenues from oil, gas, and, and, and coal. Otherwise, their members of Congress are gonna be dead set against anything that's gonna result in 30% or 40% budget cuts to the state government. Yeah, there's, there's gotta be an economic development plan coupled with a financial management transition plan. And we know this is happening. And so, you know, the idea is how can we get it to happen? And how could public administrators make sure it gets administrated properly. James, you want a, a last word oh, on this particular subject? Would, uh, I'm sure I'm on. Yeah, state, what may be obvious to many people, but this is an issue that is very peculiar to different states. Uh, you could have investor-owned utilities run by a public service commission, as we have in Florida, where there's very little lo local input to what we also happen in Houston, which is just the opposite. Uh, and federal government really doesn't play much of a direct role on those things as it appears to us at the local level. It's trying to figure out the, uh, the political and economic impact of dealing with whatever regulatory system is created to, to guide that. And, and then the real issue from, that I see, not being an expert in this area per se, is the grid itself. How do we, we might be able to create alternative renewable energy in many places, but to get it to where it's needed to substitute for the carbon is, is a huge issue. And who pays for that, uh, I think is the ultimate thing we're gonna have to hash out. And that may be better thought about at the federal level. Yeah. yeah again, I think this is like resilience. There's gotta be some federal resources uh, to help facilitate the local, the local transitions and needs. So look, we are um, at the end of our appointed time here. Um, I want to thank uh, all three panelists. You guys are great. Um, uh, uh, Terry for uh, inviting us and, and, uh, and for the Academy for uh, organizing this and actually for organizing uh, the 12 grand challenges uh, that uh, the country faced because it trans all these things are interrelated. I, I think in our conversation here today, we probably touched on several of the other ones you know, whether it's resilience or, or others. So 
Um, I really, uh, water, for instance. Uh, so um, thank you guys on the panel. Uh, thanks the Academy. And Terry, if you have any last word, it's yours and I'm signing off. I'll just echo that, Bob. It was a wonderful conversation. Thanks to all of you for giving us your time um, and your brilliant insights. Thanks to all of you who joined us for the conversation uh, and happy Earth Day. Thank you.